Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Central. If you're a guest of ours, my name's Craig. Great to see you here with us this morning as we begin a six-week journey through the book of Acts. Now, the great thing with this, of course, is that many of you, hundreds of you, undertook a radical minimum challenge to 28 days of prayer and the study of the Scriptures. And, and we committed ourselves to just reading one chapter a day. And uh, we intentionally put you through the book of Acts knowing that we would be spending six weeks now in the book of Acts together. And so our prayer is that as we just open up the text, Steve and I, over the next six weeks, that you would be taken even deeper into the truth of the Word of God. Not that it would, uh, you would read it and understand more, but that somehow the Spirit of God would start to kind of line you up in terms of your mission as a part of his body in the world. Now to do that, we have got uh, C6 groups that are starting today. And uh, for those of you who wanna just to go a little bit deeper into the text, in the company of friends, you can still sign up for a C6 group at the information desk or also signing up online. Now I can tell you, you're all looking at these balloons. That will become evident later on. It's really interesting when we bring stuff out, you can just see the mind shift and it's like, hey, come back here. Um, but it's really good to, uh, to welcome you. We're going to be in the book of Acts. We're going to start in Acts chapter 1, and we're going to read from verses 6 through 11. That's my focal point today, because this really does set up the movement through the entire book of Acts. Acts 1.8, we'll see this today, is a pivotal text for understanding what's going to happen in the rest of the story as God gets his church fit for the mission that he's called her to. If you took a pew Bible or a Bible in the auditorium, it's page 1090. If you haven't got access to the scriptures, you can look at the screen, which is what I'm going to do as well. Acts chapter one from verse six. Now Jesus has appeared to them. He's been raised. He's about to be ascended to his father in heaven. And there is this conversation that is going on between them. So then they gathered around him, the disciples gathered around him, 120 people probably, and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Notice the question, that's verse 6. He said to them, verse 7, it's not for you to know the times or dates of the Father that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the very ends of the earth. That's verse 8, pivotal text for the rest of the book. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, hold on to that, please. Men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Men of Galilee, why are you standing, staring up into the sky? He is one day going to come back, but until then, this is what you do. And they made it go, they made it back to Jerusalem. They locked themselves into an upper room and they began to wait just as Jesus had said that they should. Now, verse 6 here starts with the disciples asking a question Jesus, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? So the disciples' question, the disciples' understanding of the significance of the death, burial, resurrection, and now the ascension of Jesus was that all the world would come to Israel. And they would find themselves at the center of this as leaders. Verse 7 functions to change their mind. Hey, wait a minute. It's not going to work like you think it's supposed to. Change your mind. The first task that Jesus has in getting his people ready for mission is to change their mind. They had an understanding about what God was going to do in the world. And Jesus says, hey, change your mind. So in order to get his people fit for mission, God needed to change their mind. It's true. You fitness freaks will know this, right? Any kind of fitness, getting fit for something invariably involves a change of mind. He's going to change their mind. That's the point of verse 8. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. What Jesus is saying here is, hey, listen, you know this idea about the, the kingdom being restricted to, to Israel? Well, guess what? The Spirit of God is going to be out 
outpoured, unleashed. And that same spirit that has been kind of withheld since the last of the prophets is now going to be unleashed on the church. And he is going to not bring everybody from the world to you, but he is actually going to send you into the world. You've got it wrong. That's the point of verse 8. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. This is a pivotal verse in the book of Acts, and everything that's going to happen in the rest of the book of Acts is basically flows from this outline. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the ends of the earth. This is the story of how God had to work in his people to get them fit for the mission that he has called them to. And it began by changing their mind about how that would happen. What I want to do this morning is I want to change a number of minds about the significance of Acts 1.8. Because all too often, Acts 1.8, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the ends of the earth, is used to describe the sequential growth, expansion of mission from Jerusalem, which is our home, through Judea, which is our state, through Samaria, which is our nation, into the ends of the world. And so people have this idea that what Jesus is saying here is essentially that mission begins at home. While I understand this, there is a massive drawback to holding this idea. Firstly, the first problem with this idea of, hey, Acts 1.8 is about the sequential nature of the expansion of mission in the church. It goes from here to there through some intermediate steps. The problem with this is we don't recognize the work that God has to do to get his people fit for mission. It's as if we think, well, the disciples were here in Jerusalem, so that's where mission begins, because mission always begins at home. And the problem with this is so many of us think that mission at home is therefore simple, and mission across the other side of the world is actually difficult. Now, logistically speaking, we probably agree that there's a difference, right? Mission across the other end of the world exposes us to certain challenges like language, like culture, like other religious beliefs and groups, political restrictions. Logistically speaking, it's true. It, It is, in a sense, more difficult here. But let me ask you this question. How many of you actually find it easy to do mission or outreach here? How many of you find it easy to talk about Jesus to the people who know you the best, love you the most, but they don't share your faith? Am I the only one that finds that difficult? See, the problem with understanding Acts 1.8 is just the sequential expansion of mission and that the disciples were in Jerusalem and they started mission in Jerusalem because that was home to them. It gives us this idea that it was somehow easy to them. But folks, when we look at Acts, what we realize is stepping out for Jesus is rarely comfortable, familiar, easy, and safe wherever we are. Wherever we are. It's never comfortable, easy, and safe. It's often difficult. And see, the problem with this is so many times we'll talk about Easter and Christmas and say, these are great opportunities for you to invite people. And as soon as we do that, we can just feel it sometimes. It's as if somebody on the inside is feeling, but I've never done that and I'm too afraid to do it. I've never done it and I'm too afraid to do it. (coughs) Craig, you're asking me to do something that's really uncomfortable. It was easier for the disciples. It's easier for you because you're a pastor. But church... It is rarely comfortable, familiar, easy, or safe to step out in faith for Jesus. And and if we look at the book of Acts, it's kind of what we see. We see these markers, right? These kind of markers throughout the book of Acts. Acts 1.8, and then we see how the story's going to go. 1.1.7.60, Jerusalem, okay? Uh, Judea, Samaria, Acts 8, Acts 11. Ends of the earth, Acts 11, uh, through Acts 28, and then that's where we are all the way over here today, okay? And I'll get to Acts 19 later on because it's what God does. But this is the story in the book of Acts. 
And basically what we see is in every single place, it's hard. It isn't comfortable, it isn't easy, and it isn't safe. This idea, you know, mission begins at home because home is easy. Well, guess what? They were threatened, they were beaten, and one of them was even killed. It makes you think, if that's life at home, why does anybody dare to venture venture away? Why do we do it? So you see, the lesson in the book of Acts is, listen, mission, stepping out for Jesus, isn't easy, comfortable, familiar, and safe for the followers of Jesus. It was hard. And guess what that means? The good news is, if you're here today and you find it really difficult speaking out and stepping out for Jesus, guess what? The disciples know exactly how it felt. And the God that empowered them to step out, if we want him to, will empower us to step out as well. See, what we often think is that mission for the disciples was easier because, well, they were really comfortable in Jerusalem. But folks, Jerusalem was not their home. What Acts 1.8 teaches us is not that mission begins at home, but that all mission is local. There's a fundamental difference between the two. Throughout my ministry, I have been often confronted with people in the congregation who believe that mission begins at home, Acts 1.8. And they will invariably come to me and they will basically say, Pastor, we should not be investing money away until we've actually finished the work at home because mission begins at home. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. And it sounds great, doesn't it? But the only problem with that, I say, is that Jerusalem wasn't the disciples' home. Mission doesn't begin at home. Mission begins where God has placed his people. All mission is local. In a sense, this division between local mission and global mission is a misnomer. All mission exists where God's people are. It's always local. See, if you look at the story of the disciples, Jerusalem wasn't their home. Jerusalem wasn't comfortable for them. The mission didn't start in Jerusalem because it was home, but because that's where God said it needed to begin. Men of what? Galilee. Men of Galilee. It wasn't comfortable for them in Jerusalem. They didn't start in Jerusalem because that was home. They started in Jerusalem because that's where God said it needed to start. And you know what? If you're a follower of Jesus, when God says, hey, go there, you go. (laughs) And it often isn't comfortable. Secondly, Jerusalem wasn't familiar for them either. Dick France, a New Testament professor, written many books on the Gospels, he notes this, there were racial, geographical, political, economic, cultural, religious, and linguistic differences between Galileans and Jerusalemites. See, the Galileans spoke with a harsh Aramaic accent that resulted in them dropping their H's, whereas the Jerusalemites did not. I love this because the Welsh language, when Welsh people speak English, we actually drop our H's. So instead of saying, how are you, we say, how are you? That's basically the way we do it, we drop our H's. That's kind of like a Welshman in London, an Englishman in New York, or a Welshman in Holland. We stand out. It isn't familiar. So that's what we see here at the arrest of Jesus. After a little while, those standing there went up to Peter and said, surely you are one of them, your accent gives you away. You see, this, the idea that it was comfortable, the idea that it was familiar, they stood out like a sore thumb. So the disciples didn't embrace Jerusalem because it was similar. They embraced it even though it was different. 
And I can see a number of you taking photos of this and, and different things. All of the slides will basically be on, uh, online, so you'll be able to go online, download all of the, all of the slides today. Jerusalem also wasn't easy. It wasn't easy. The ministry of Jesus was seen as a Galilean revolution at odds with Jerusalem Orthodoxy. Now, the verses I've got up there are three of many. These are verses where the leaders of the religious grouping in Jerusalem send people down to Jesus because they've heard rumors that there is this rabbi who is doing something that they need to pay attention to. See, the ministry of Jesus was considered at his inception a Galilean movement, but the growth of this movement was so big that the Jerusalem leaders had to keep their eye on Jesus. And this was a problem for a number of people as they tried to wrestle with, is Jesus the Messiah? And we see this in John chapter 7. On hearing his words, Jesus' words, some of the people said, surely this man is the prophet. Others said, he is the Messiah. Still others asked, how can the Messiah come from Galilee. Does not scripture say that the Messiah will come from David's descendants and from Bethlehem, the town where David lived? See, it's not comfortable, Jerusalem. It wasn't familiar. It wasn't uh, easy, and it isn't safe either. Jesus died there. Peter and John and Paul were arrested there and imprisoned, and basically Stephen and James were killed there. Oh, mission begins at home. Ah, oh, it's easier for the disciples. Folks, Jerusalem wasn't their home. Mission doesn't begin at home. Mission begins where God has placed you right now. Right now. That's why Jesus, knowing what Jerusalem was like, says this shortly before he died. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who killed the prophets and stoned those sent to you. How often have I longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were not willing. See, church, stepping out for Jesus is rarely comfortable, familiar, easy, and safe, wherever we are. So why do we do it? Why do we do it? You know, when you read the book of Acts, the reason that they stepped out is very simple. God broke out. God broke through. And people were given this fresh revelation of the risen and the ascended Jesus, and it just flowed out. God got his church fit for mission by giving them a fresh revelation of, the, of heaven and the ascended Jesus. And mission, very much like getting physically fit, right, is often done against one's wishes and is sustained by comprehending that the alternative is far worse. Many of you have heard me at the start of the year say, hey, I just came back and I ran 10 miles with Vipka, and some people said, did he train for it? I went, no, zero to 10. It's a bit of a radical thing to do, right? And of course, having made that off-the-cuff gesture, which Vipka held me to, so if you ever say something to my wife, she'll hold you to it. That's basically the, the, the point with this. And uh, of course, on the outside, I was saying to Vipka, yeah, that's fine, no problem. But on the inside, I'm going, oh my Lord, what have I done? Right, my mind is everywhere and nowhere. I've made this commitment, and now I had to follow it through. Mission is often done against one's wishes. When I was growing up, I was aware of the fact that my mother suffered from vertigo, which is basically, you know, kind of when she sees height, she kind of loses her balance, that kind of stuff. And I used to think that growing up, the worst thing that could happen was actually being afraid of heights. But the older I get, and the more I realize that the worst thing that can happen is for me to be afraid of widths, right? Come on, guys, go with me here. Yeah, you just realize you get to this point and, and you just have to get fit. Why? Because we've only got one body and it needs to be taken care of. In the same way, Jesus recognizes he's only got one body and he needs to get the body fit. And the way to get the body fit, the body of Christ fit, was to actually give them a fresh revelation of who he was and what he was calling them to do. And that overcame, that overcame the fears of the flesh. And it kind of propelled them 
into mission in the world as they comprehended that the alternative, not taking the message of Jesus to the world, was far worse than anything that could happen to them. And I think that's the point when it comes to being on mission, as we would call it, for Jesus, talking about Jesus, being the hands and feet of Jesus where he's placed us. It's realizing that the alternative, staying quiet, is far worse, not simply for me, but for the people I'm around. If I have a fresh revelation of who Jesus is and of what the gospel means, then guess what? I will be more likely to step out and overcome those obstacles, those things that are holding me back. But it happens by catching a fresh glimpse of who Jesus is, and then there is this break out. Let's go back to this screen. What we see in the screen here is basically the way the story worked. Stepping out for Jesus was never familiar, easy, or comfortable. But when they did, there was always fruit. When they did, there was always fruit. And so we see the fruit in the early section, the Jerusalem section. Acts chapter two, Peter gets up, preaches his first sermon. People are cut to the core and they have a fresh revelation of who Jesus is and they say, what do we need to do? And Peter says, repent and be baptized. It's really interesting that part. In a few moments, we're gonna celebrate the baptism of a few people, but in an area like this, so many people have a fear about stepping out and going public with their faith in Jesus through baptism because they've been baptized once already. Well, do you not realize that the people who heard Peter that day had already, more than likely, the vast majority of them been baptized in the baptism of John? Is a rebaptism. So many people have a fear of stepping out because of their tradition and and their religion when in reality they stepped out and all of a sudden that energized, that energized the ministry of the church. There's fruit. You see that there's persecution. They have a fresh revelation of Jesus with all the threats and they push through and there was, uh, they were filled with the spirit. There was unity. There was witness. There's joy, witness. There's a vision of Jesus' glory. There's always fruit when we obey because blessing always follows obedience. But so what's the solution then? Just do it? No. We need a fresh revelation of Jesus. I'll get to that in a moment. We see in the next section right here. We just see that they basically move out. They have a fresh revelation of Jesus. God does something. And he causes the believers there to just press out into Judea and Samaria. And then you go into this last section here, this third section. Acts chapter, Acts chapter 12 following. Uh, ministry to the ends of the world. Same thing, this fruit, because they pressed out, they pushed through. This last section here I'll talk about in a moment. Acts 19, from the time of Ephesus through until his journey to Rome. What we see, folks, is that it was never easy, comfortable, familiar, or safe, but when they pushed through it, God always brought the fruit. But now the kind of question is, how do we push through it, right? And this is the significance of these four balloons. See, what happens is Jesus says, listen, I know you've got an idea of mission that everybody comes to you, but my idea of mission is actually that you go into the world. But listen, you can't do this in your own strength because it's a really tough place. So here's what I want you to do. I I want you to wait for the promise of the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter two, Spirit comes. The Bible says it was like a sound of a mighty rushing wind. Boom. What happened? Read the text. They're propelled out of the room. 120 people frightened, prayed up, but staying away, are propelled out of the room because bang, the Spirit of God comes, gives them a fresh revelation of who God is and they're propelled out of the room. The people in this religious uh, festival suddenly hear the disciples praising God, they say, in our own language, and they ask themselves, how on earth is this possible? You know what led to mission in Jerusalem? It was a fresh outpouring of the Holy Spirit. That's what led to mission in Jerusalem. That's what enabled them to overcome their fear and their doubt. The story goes on. They're in Jerusalem, great, ministry's going in Jerusalem. 
But now they get to the area of Judea and Samaria. There's a guy called Philip. Philip is one of the, uh, one of the seven who is there to help administer the, the kind of schism between the Hellenistic uh, widows, the Greek widows, and the Hebrew widows. And, and that ministry was kind of wrapping up. And, and God anoints this guy. Stephen and Philip were two of the seven that were just anointed with almost apostolic-like uh, gifting. And Stephen grows further and further out in his ministry. And, and he gets to the Samaritans. And, and oh boy, it's a problem. Bang! Spirit of God comes down on these Samaritans. The church have freaked out. In fact, they're so freaked out that the Samaritans have just received this same spirit that fell on us in the day of Acts, that they basically sent Peter up to Samaria, to the Judea-Samaria reason, and say, Peter, go and investigate what's going on. And Peter gets there. He prays for someone. This same spirit falls on them, and they, they're like, okay, we don't get this. <laughs> These kind of half breeds have just been brought in, but this must be what God is doing. And we go, duh. He said it to you in Acts 1.8. But what happens then? Ministry, this is at the start of Acts 8, ministry in Judea and Samaria now breaks out. Why? Because people got a fresh revelation of who Jesus is. And that propelled ministry everywhere else. You want ministry, powerful ministry to happen where God has placed you? You know what you do? You don't just do it. You get on your knees and you say, Jesus, I need a fresh revelation of who you truly are. Because when you've got a fresh revelation of who Jesus is, you're willing to step up because the alternative is so much worse. But now they get it, right? Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria. No, they don't. And so Peter finds himself in Joppa, a place called Joppa. And as he's in Joppa, he has this vision. And this vision is of a, of a sheet, of a blanket, with all of these animals coming down. They're unclean. And God speaks to Peter and says, Peter, here's what I want you to do. I, I want you to take these animals and eat it. And Peter says, I'm not going to do that. I'm a Jew. That's not kosher. And God looks at him and says, how dare you say that what I've made is unclean? And with that, knock at the door. Some Gentiles who've, through a revelation of Jesus, sought out Peter. And Peter now journeys from Joppa up to Caesarea Philippi. And there he prays and... <laughs> now this one needed a lot of explanation because these were even, not even half priests. These were way out there. So Peter, this is Acts chapter 10. Peter now has to go back to... Jerusalem and explain this one. But guess what happens? Ministry happens. The church is propelled because they just see God breaking through, God breaking out. Because someone, people have had a fresh revelation of who Jesus is. It inspires everyone else. And there's mission, there's ministry. Now what's interesting with these two, and what's interesting with all of these, is that when you look at the book of Acts, you realize that God works in incredible ways at strategically significant places. This week, I'm going to go to a, a part of the world where it's very difficult to be a follower of Jesus and share the gospel. But someone who leads that ministry in that land actually came to faith in Jesus Christ by God coming to them in the form of a vision and saying, you want to know who I am? I'll tell you who I am. Go to the house that I will show you. Is this not Acts chapter 10 or what? Now this person is actually leading the indigenous movement of the church in that place. Caesarea Philippi was strategically important. Do you know why? Paul would later at the end of the Acts stand before, uh, stand before the political leaders and share his faith in Jesus right there in that spot. It was from that spot that he would journey to Rome, the center of the world. Some people have said the book of Acts should really be called from Jerusalem to the center of the world. It's as if God is pouring out his spirit right there and saying, church, you know what? I'm propelling you. I'm with you. Get a fresh revelation of me and then every obstacle that you will ever encounter will fade as you realize that the alternative, staying where you are, not stepping out, not pushing on, is so much worse than any punishment or pain that will await you. And then we get to Acts 19. Ha! Ah, had to be one. This is the moment where Paul looks at the Ephesian elders and, and just basically says, hey guys, uh, I, I'm listening to you speak and I'm not really sure that you're saved. Tell me, what baptism did you receive? 
They say what? John's baptism. What was John's baptism? John's baptism was a baptism of preparation for the one who was to come. And John said, listen, the one who comes after you will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. So Paul hears this and says, okay, wait a minute. I know that you guys have, have, have partook in that ministry of repentance, but that was repentance in preparation for the one who was to come. Have you received that baptism of the Holy Spirit? Now, some people will say baptism of the Holy Spirit is what happens down here, Acts 2. But what I'm showing you is, hey, there is more than one. There's only one Pentecost, right, 50 days. But there are a number of Pentecost moments in Acts as God empowers his church. And so my problem with the Pentecostals is basically, why are you limiting God to one? Why can't there be more than one? My encounter with God, the second, the third, and the fourth time, has been far more powerful than it ever was the first. And so basically, Paul looks at him and says, wait a minute, baptism of John, tell me, um, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you were saved? And they said, what, what do you mean? We haven't even heard there was a Holy Spirit. Bang! Strategically significant place why the New Testament canon was put together there, but also this is the place from which Paul would go into that last section of his life where he would be imprisoned. And it was as if God was saying, listen, Paul, the hardship that is coming is going to bring you to the center of the world. That's my plan and my purpose for your life. See, church, for us to truly step into the mission that God has for us. What we need to realize is this. Stepping out for Jesus is rarely comfortable, familiar, easy, and safe wherever we are. But when we step out, God always brings the fruit. And so what's the solution to this? That we basically say, okay, I'm going to talk to everybody about Jesus right now. No, that's your effort. The solution to this is we fall on our knees and we say, Jesus, give me a fresh revelation of who you are. Because in that moment, the alternative, the alternative, staying where we are, is far worse. That, that's the key. When you have a fresh revelation of Jesus, like the Samaritans did, like the Gentiles did, like even these church leaders did, it propels the mission of the church forward. These Pentecost experiences, as I call them, the four of them, propel the church into the world because it wasn't easy in church. It's never easy. But the promise is this. When we have a fresh revelation of Jesus, we will step out. 